This is a production of Cornell University. My name is Jacob Johnston. I'm with uh, Project Yard Map at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, a citizen science program aimed at creating habitat in your yard. Yard Map essentially allows scientists to better understand how landscape use and gardening choices affect birds and wildlife populations in a residential or urban settings. Now, most of us have yards that were at one time a wild space before it was a yard, before it was a city, before it was a neighborhood, before it was anything. Um, and so we're sort of getting back into this culture. We're looking at ways that we can share the space um, with ecological, um, ecological sort of concepts and uh, techniques using ecology in the way that it was, has been um, proceeding through you know, centuries of, of time in order to coexist, basically. Um, there's been a new understanding of sharing spaces and a new concern for, the, or, you know, a greater concern for the environment over time. And so, you know, Yard Map seeks to, you know, help, uh, I guess, use that concern a little bit, but also uh, nurture it and, and help people to make better decisions based on education. And that's one thing that citizen science is really all about, is using the public to not only teach them more about what they're doing and what they're interested in, but also uh, to provide better data back for us so that we can create uh, better best use practices, best practices and things like that to send back out to those citizen sciences and to the community. So in a, in a sharing, ecologically sharing the space, you would have room for you, you would have your yard, you would have you know, like a vegetable garden or something like that. And you have some wild areas and some cult, um, some structure and some some native lands around it too, like forest edges. So a lot of us are are backyard conservationists these days. It's you know nature is becoming a very big uh, part of of or the environmentalism is becoming a very big part of our culture and society. And we know that there's a lot of people out there that are enthusiastic about it, that they want to uh, participate in protecting and in and protecting nature and conserving. Um, well, birds, wildflowers, trees, and now there's this great big push for pollinators like bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. So how do we engage the backyard conservationists? How do we get people to put forth the effort and collaborate and work together and join knowledge and essentially be a more uh, refined and robust tool? Well, that's what the, that's what the Covenant Alive and Foreign Anthology excels at. And what we do here is uh, focus collective, atta collective talents um, to, you know, to solve problems that people in urban and residential areas may be, may be noticing. We have lots of programs at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that monitor different types of environments, different types of habitats, and different types of activities that birds and other, of course, and other wildlife um, engage in. And the more citizen scientists we have out there telling us what, you know, is going on in the backyards and the neighborhoods and things like that of, of places, then the more we can understand how those animals are using it, what they need, and what is not working and what is working. At the lab, we revolve around bird conservation. Uh, currently, there's over 350,000 people um, engaged in bird conservation activities. Those are citizen scientists, mostly. So why birds? Why are we interested in birds, what is it special about birds that um, has such a draw and has um, such an engagement with the public? And they're very charismatic. They're indicators of environmental health. Their migration patterns and distributions can tell us a lot about um, the environments that they use, the habitats that, they're, that they utilize, and where they, where they can and can't go, basically. Um, they tell us that the population densities and their abundance and diversity can tell us a lot about the environmental health as well. They occur in all different types of habitats. This is a greater prairie chicken that occurs in a very small year-round range um, from about Kansas, I think, up through North Dakota, just in a small band there. And then you've got the Arctic tern, who has a 24,000, 25,000-mile migration range. From pole to pole, it takes an entire year. So this bird here is, uh, you know, circumglobal, whereas the other one is a very small niche habitat that's pretty, uh, pretty specific to what it needs. The Arctic tern, as well, on the coasts and in the poles, where it has, where it breeds and overwinters, 
you know, requires a certain type of habitat, but also all the spaces in between every connecting point that it lands and stops on its year round migration needs to be some sort of habitat and some sort of space for it. So uh, we use birds because they encompass the entire globe and they encompass almost every aspect of our lives. They have um, really unique and in, uh, um, amazing behaviors. This kill deer is known for its uh, impressive display of being uh, broken or wounded when you approach its nest. It builds a nest here in the, in the gravel. You might even be able to find the nest if you look closely in the gravel, but it's very camouflaged. And when a predator or a threat approaches the nest, they sort of limp away with a broken wing. Uh, they bend their wing funny so it looks broken. So these intricate um, and unique habits that birds have, you know, interest people. They really grab people's attention. They become these charismatic fauna that um, gain support from the public. They can be anything from meek to majestic, like this red-tailed hawk here that's found across the country. And they're very integrated into our into our lives, into our urban and rural landscapes. We share the whole we share our world with them, whether we know it or not. If you can see the snowy owl in this picture. There it is, which is a, you know not an owl that you see very often, but they do incorporate themselves into our landscape. And so, what we want to know is how can we best um, coexist with them? Because you know they incorporate, they're going to live there, they're going to be around. Um, how many they are and how healthy they are is sort of up to us now that we understand uh, what their needs are. Um, so, birding is a very very popular recreational pastime. 85 million Americans across the country participate yearly. $900 million um, are invested annually in bird watching and birding and support like this. One of our biggest programs at the Lab of Ornithology here in Citizen Science is the eBird program. We also have the Project Feeder Watch, which has 17,000 users that participate in a four-month feeder watch study through the winter and the early spring where they watch, uh, they put out bird feeders and put out different types of feed and different types of feed, uh, food for the birds and that. Um, and then they collect the data. They count the birds and they report that data um, through online tools. Nest Watch grew 32% in 2013, and it's on track now to break the 20,000 nest record. I'm sorry, to break a record of 20,000 nests protected. So they're... Um, they're, they're really getting big and popular, and this is a program that you can participate in where you locate nests. You actually have to take a training course and learn how to be a part of this citizen science project so that you don't infringe on the safety or the health of these birds while they're nesting. And so a lot of people really appreciate that and learn a lot and of appreciation and respect and have a lot of gained admiration through projects like this. Another one that's really popular is Cubs, Celebrate Urban Birds. This one boasts over 250,000 members from 23,000 urban areas. Uh, they mentor un, un, uh, disadvantaged kids, and they even have a program where they teach uh, birding by ear to blind youths. So we have all these programs, and they're all online. And they have some of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has some of the best tools for engaging citizen scientists. But there's one thing that's missing, something that's a little more personal, a little more closer to all of us, and that's our yards. Now, why would we want to focus on yards? What exactly is about? Is it with yards that um, drew our attention and made us want to uh, reach out to people Well, if we take a look at the average American yard, we see that it's not really bird friendly. And in fact, it's not really environmentally friendly. So the, the, the average American lawn is about 60% of the 60% grass. And it contains a lot of impervious areas like the grass, like the uh, driveway here and the rooftops. Um, there's usually a small area for maybe a flower or vegetable garden. But most of our, our, our most of our property, our American yard, is lawn. And that uh, lawn is not a very good habitat. So we try to encourage a reduction in lawn. 
It's actually one of our nation's biggest crops, and it's not very good habitat. So with this increasing um, growth of urban and residential areas across the country, every day, or every year, I'm sorry, about the size of West Virginia it becomes um, settled, urbanized, or somehow um, turned in from wild habitat into human habitat. And so the, the growth is, is growing um, at a rate that is hard to keep up with. And so what we want to do is instead of changing that habitat into something else, we want to work with that habitat with yard man. We try to encourage people to think small with their lawns, um, be environmentally friendly, and use uh, other type of landscaping in your yard besides a lawn that is more effective and more efficient in providing habitat for birds and wildlife. Something like this. There's a bee there. There's a collection of wildflowers. This is obviously much more bountiful and plentiful and environmentally friendly for any sort of creature that may be wandering through your yard or flying overhead. Or... So how do we create habitat for birds and wildlife in our yard? What are the main ingredients? What is it that we need uh, to focus on? Well, the main ingredients is our food, water, and shelter, just like anything. And freedom from danger, which is something that isn't always um, at the top of the list or at the front of our thoughts when we're creating habitat in our yards. Food, water, shelter, and freedom from danger creates a habitat. But what do we mean when we talk about food? A bird feeder with seed is good. We can provide food for birds in that sense. Most people don't realize though, or maybe they don't realize that birds eat more than seed. They eat bugs. Most birds eat mostly bugs. <laughs> and here's a, a Eastern blue bird doing the caterpillar thwomp, I think they call it. Or they, uh, it's a high force smash onto something that breaks the skin apart and makes it easier to digest. And boy, do they eat caterpillars, a single pair of breeding chickadees Need 75,000 caterpillars per season to raise three to five nestlings. So how do we get these caterpillars? How do we bring in the bugs to feed the birds? Well, if we look at some data that was produced shortly ago, we, real, we see that caterpillar richness, the diversity of cat caterpillars, the number of caterpillars, and the number of species uh, greatly outnumber uh, the number of caterpillars and the number of species on non-native or introduced invasive plants as compared to native plants. If you look, and then wood, woody plants are even um, much greater attractant to butterflies and anything else that lays eggs and produces caterpillars or larvae. So to provide food, we need to provide plants that provide bugs that provide the food. We also need to provide water for birds. They get water out of the food they eat, and they get water flying around, um, you know, over lakes and ponds and things. They're, they're, they move around a lot, but they don't always, they don't move a lot every day or, let's see, I'm sorry, I mixed up here. So providing water in strategic places across the landscape, such as yards, really uh, makes this connectivity across the landscape and increases their chances of uh, finding habitat. So when we, when we talk about water, so it could be anything. If you don't have a pond or a creek running through your yard, um, if you do, then you're providing water. If you don't, say if you're in a suburban area or um, a, a dense urban area, then there's a lot of other ways you can provide water for birds, like bird baths. And here are some um, tips that we provide on Yard Map for the, you know, for ideal bird baths. Because we want them to be safe, we want them to be clean, and we don't want them to be um, traps. If you have too deep of a bird bath, or if it's not clean on a regular basis, 
um, or if it's shrouded by shrubs or trees, then it can be preyed on by cats, things like that. Um, so we, one of the great things about citizen science is this back and forth, this call and response. Is, you know, put water in your yard. Well, then we get this you know, response back. Well, you know, I put water in my yard, but you know, these birds drowned in it. Well, why did they drown in it? So we understand you know, what better and more effective and efficient types of water we can provide for birds. You know, and, it, and it goes back and forth. Structure is another thing that's very important to provide in your yard for birds. Birds need structure to perch on, to display from, for mating, to call from. They need structure to build nests in. And structure can be any number of things. Structure means anything from um, vertical height to horizontal width to texture. Uh, here's a little advertisement that we put out through YardMap that talks about um, the diversity of structure in your yard. Now, birds aren't taxonomous. They don't necessarily know the species of the plants in your yard, but they do know the texture of the needles or the leaves. They do know the density of the branches. They do know the height of the tree or the quality of the wood that is being built, that, you know, that they're building their nests out of or something like that. And so having a diversity, they're, oops, I'm sorry. They're actually experts at what they need. And we're, and we are the ones that are capable of providing it or not taking it away. Say if we're building a new home somewhere and instead of clearing all the trees from an area, you could leave them and just, and uh, even this, is another thing that we promote here is dead trees. Sometimes dead trees are more productive and more um, provide more or have more species using them than a live tree does. These, uh, these are called snags and they're rotting wood and they provide homes for all kinds of bugs, which provides foods for the birds. They also provide holes like cavities for nesting birds. Um, the other thing that we need besides food, water, and shelter is freedom from danger. Um, and this can be a number of things. Freedom from danger is, uh, refers to um, anything that may draw your, your draw uh, or attract birds or wildlife to your yard, but then hides or disguises some danger there that uh, you may not know of yourself. Well, uh, we hear a lot about uh, Cats and oh, my cat would never, you know, never hurt a bird, or maybe only get one or two here and there, something like that. But the reality is, birds kill billions of birds every year because there are billions of cats, <laughs> maybe killing several a year. So it may not seem like much, but in the end, it it is um, a very powerful force against bird populations. Like this is a, a graphic that shows. Um, freedom from danger from windows. Um, some new recent studies have come out through uh, Feeder Watch that show that feeders that have, are placed in the wrong space or close, too close to a, I'm sorry, too close to a house but not close enough um, create a deadly collision zone where birds frightened from a feeder or startled from a feeder will gain enough speed but not have enough I guess, agility to, to clear the house or clear a window. Um, if they're closer to the house, their speed is not that great. If they're farther from the house, then they have the, the distance to make the adjustments. But there is a zone that we found through citizen science that you know, is, is more deadly for placing feeders. Also, uh, wind to mow. Sometimes if you have large yards, mowing can um, endanger fledglings or nestlings that haven't fledged yet. So all of these things work together, and they all need to work together with us as we all are integrated in, in this coexistence that we're uh, discovering more and more about over time. Um, in terms of coexistence, we're realizing also that a greater diversity of birds and a greater diversity of plants and uh, wildlife around a neighborhood or around a group of people improves their well-being, and this is true in almost any demographic and almost any society. And so what YardMap seeks to do is um, collaborate with groups of people to join people together and to create a community of YardMappers, a community of people making connections or connecting points 
Um, connectivity is a very big concept in ecology that connects um, large expanses of wild areas through small expanses of wild areas like yards. One yard that's yard mapped and is being managed for wildlife is great. Two yards is even better because that provides stepping stones from, say, a national forest to, you know, Lake Saranac or something. Then you have you have these stepping stones of habitat. And when you have stepping stones connected, you have corridors. So you have corridors and stepping stones and all of this. You know, when a community works together to provide all the necess necessary or essential parts of a habitat across the landscape, that's when we can all make a really big difference. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.